Good evening. I'm Steve Pribble, CEO of District 1 Hospital, Ferbo. Um, I am a pinch hitter. Matt Anderson called me yesterday afternoon <laughs> and said, asked if I would join the panel, and I, I quickly said yes. Um, I also have been trying, I've been scratching my head thinking about the, uh, the panel this evening. We've so far heard from a senator, three physicians, two lawyers, and now you're going to listen to a hospital administrator. And, and I, I, I don't know what that means, but um, I represent a very, well, I don't know if it's unique or different uh, area of health care. Uh, for those that are familiar with Faribault, it's located just an hour south of Minneapolis, right on Interstate 35. And I remember when I was contacted by the search firm asking if I'd be interested in taking the position there, uh, I said no. In fact, at that point in time, I was employed by the Mayo Clinic Health System. Uh, we were doing some dynamic things. It was a lot of fun, and, and I, I felt secure in my position. And then I did secret shopping at, at the Ferbo Healthcare Campus, and I drove onto the campus, and the first thing I saw was a, a nice monument sign that said Healthcare Campus, and it listed multiple providers. It listed uh, a group, a private practice orthopedic group called the Orthopedic Fracture Clinic. It listed a line of medical clinic. It listed Mayo Clinic Health System. And in fact, I remember stopping for gas in Faribault, and I saw an ambulance that said North Memorial Ambulance Service, Faribault. Um, I thought, this could be fun. This could be kind of intriguing. And so 20 months ago, I started in, in Faribault. And as many CEOs do, the first thing they do is do strategic planning. And one thing we did is we made it comprehensive, rigorous, and inclusive strategic, strategic planning. We included the physician leaders of each of those practices with a couple of our board members as the planning task force. And then we included the entire medical staff in an evening session with the draft of a new vision, mission, and our value statement. And one physician at the end of the evening said it was the most inclusive evening they'd experienced in 20 years. And part of it was the dance on the campus, the, the fact that we had multiple practices. And our new vision um, for an independent district hospital, which is a bit of a dinosaur. We are a governmental em entity. We have taxing authority. Um, and our new vision is, is a bit, I don't want to say controversial, but we're thinking forward. And that is that we will be the community's first choice for integrated health care because we're first in quality service and access. And access is not only access to our care locally, but access to other places, Rochester, Abbott, Northwestern, and so on. And then we developed six critical strategies that we felt were important. We did this together. Achieve commitment to the vision from all the players. We couldn't move forward, and, and I really appreciate Dr. Nessie's comments about integration isn't necessarily ownership and so on. It's coming together for a single focus. Achieve maximum integration to improve the value and reduce duplication. We have four electronic medical records on our campus. They do not talk to each other. The hospital platform does not have discrete data. It's scanned documents. It's, we, I tell the public, I tell the community, we are the poster child of waste in healthcare. With that, think of the millions of dollars that have been spent in the little community of Faribault on a EM, bunch of EMRs that don't talk to each other. Um, in, improve quality and service in all areas. We all are seeking that. Increase specialty presence. I'm going to take a moment and tell a personal story. Several months ago, I had intense ear pain. It was sharp pencil in the ear, ear pain. I went to a family physician. He prescribed antibiotics for two weeks, nothing. I came back and he said, well, you need to see an ENT. And of course, he referred me to their system ENT. Um, I went down to the desk and I said, I'd like to see the physician. They said, well, due to his travel commitments, it will be 30 days before you can see him. I said, well, that's not going to work. And I knew that the other system also had an ENT that saw patients locally, so I called that system. And they said, due to his travel commitments, it'll be 30 days. And this, the 30 days is true. They said it different ways, but the 30 days. And I said, well, I know he sees patients in another location not far from here. Can I see him there? And kind of disappointing, they said, sure, here's the phone number. They didn't connect me. They didn't try to appoint me. <laughs> and to make matters worse, when I called the first phone number, it was disconnected. Um, I happened to be in a conversation with uh, that systems, one of that systems administrators, and I said, but I don't want you to do anything. I'll survive. I want to play this out. Oh, by the way, we have a third ENT in the community. I didn't even call that office because I'd been told he's already spending 75% of his time out of our community. So eventually, the second system called me, a nurse, 
and said, we understand you have significant ear pain. So obviously that administrator had mentioned that there's a guy in Furbo and he's uh, not happy. And I said, well, yeah, I do. And, they sh and she said, well, you gotta see an audiologist first. And, and so I got into that whole thing. <laughs> Eventually I, I scheduled an appointment with the physician three days from the call and it was in another community. I got in my car and had to drive to another community. And of course, as luck would have it, I'm driving to the, the physician's office and it dawned on me the ear pain was gone. <laughs> <laughs> now, what doesn't make sense there is we have three ENT surgeons, specialists, that see patients in Faribault and no one can get access to them for 30 days because they're covering multiple sites. And, and because of the geography, we're almost equidistant from downtown Rochester as we are to Abbott Northwestern. And with mobility and proximity, there's a nice, wonderful community hospital in Northfield and a beautiful brand new hospital and physician's practice in Owatonna just down the road. So people are mobile, but yet I can't get access. Oh, remember, I'm an insider. Think about the common healthcare consumer or patient that has to try and figure out that system. Uh, back to our six critical strategies, build awareness and loyalty. Uh, we did a, quite a bit of research in, in our marketing and a fair amount of people are leaving town for things that we can do right in Faribault. Sixteen percent, and I forget the number that are leaving town, I'd like to forget that number. Sixteen percent leave because of a perception of poor quality providers. Poor quality providers, not the hospital. Nine percent leave Faribault because of small hospital syndrome, I call it. Uh, so we have to build awareness and loyalty with our physician practices. We can't, I, you know, we the hospital don't admit patients. We don't um, schedule surgeries, et cetera, et cetera. And then of course the big buggy bugaboo, prepare for payment reform through a focus on value prevention and coordination. We've done some other things. We um, I quickly hired on a chief medical officer. I have to say in 31 years in healthcare, this was the first time I was in part of a physician's practice and I missed, I missed having a physician close by, so I've got his chief medical officer now. We hosted a campus joint visioning session with our physician leadership. Uh, and this was kind of fun. We brought them in a room and said, just bring your current organization's vision, mission, uh, value statement, documents, and we laid them on top of each other, and guess what? They were all the same. We want to provide the highest level of quality care, patient-centric. They were all the same. Now what we're, trying to, we're struggling with is how do we implement that? How do we manifest that vision? How do we make that happen? We created a quality and safety committee of the board. Uh, primarily, we, our board is made up of nine community members. They're the voting members, the chief of staff, and then myself are members, but non-voting, and then we have others uh, staff on there. But we wanted to elevate the focus on quality and safety to the board level. Uh, we created a, a, a patient and family relations department that's relatively new. It's about patient navigation in our campus. We badly need that. Uh, we happen to have a skilled nursing facility, senior uh, living facility across the street, and we're actually working out um, a series of pilots on things we can do with them. Uh, some most exciting, we created a health and wellness department, changing our view to the community's health, not be the receiver of simply acute care, you know, emergency department, OR, and so on. And we're participating in a major uh, health and wellness project funded by the Fam uh, George Family Foundation. Uh, it's a three-year project, and it was a, it's a... Um, say a surge into the community to focus on health and wellness. Uh, we, we in conjunction with the practices have uh, locally sponsored something called Project Fit Kids. I just read recently one in four kids are, are obese. Um, and we're partnering with the Chamber on action activities in the community, active activities, and that was partially funded through the SHIP grants. And one other exciting one, we have something in the community called Health Finders. It's a collaborative between Northfield and Faribault and Dundas, which is a community in between that provides a free clinic several nights a week and connects those in need to programs or helps fill out paperwork. Um, and we are underwriting their diabetic management program. We, the hospital, along with the practices, are underwriting their diabetic management program. Um, our opportunities is to leverage the wonderful expertise that surrounds us in Faribault with Mayo, Alina, and others uh, to bring high quality, low cost care to the community, turn around the out migration for us. Um, I do have a, a nightmare, I wrote a special note here, and I've heard this many times before, because I, today I celebrate high admissions, uh, celebrate high number of, of procedures in the operating room, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and I have this nightmare that on one Friday night I'm gonna go home from work celebrating a lot of admissions and Monday morning coming in and realizing that the whole system is flipped over, and how do we bridge that, and how do we get to that next place? Our threats, I was telling Dr. Nessie earlier, 
when I'm talking to the community about our healthcare campus, I'd, I'd say if we were a ballet company, the Faribault Healthcare Campus, there are two 350 pound dancers on stage with us, and although they may be very graceful as they twirl around, a 350 pound dancer could knock off someone's head, and I feel that that is a threat. We need to do it in a synchronized fashion. Um, I mentioned the EMRs, we don't have enough access. Um, we also have that challenge, particularly, well, I think it exists in many communities. Whether you're privately owned or a governmental hospital, you're quasi-governmental function because so much of your reimbursement comes from the government. And yet we must compete from that entrepreneur private practice who opens up an ambulatory surgery center and maybe brings imaging into the community. And that can then diminish, of course, the revenue stream into the public hospital that keeps the ED open 7 by 24 and does do a lot of the Medicare, Medicaid cases. Uh, big missed opportunities, it, I know they alluded to personal accountability, the patient accountability, but when I, my, my rotary speech, I always say, isn't it interesting that we pay more attention to the periodic maintenance schedule on our cars than we do to our bodies? And most people nod their heads yes. And so the personal accountability and how that can change the cost of healthcare, I think is significant. Thank you.